up, everyone? This is Adam Cromwell and Dan Cavalli here with the Full Court Press. Today, we're joined by basketball superfan Marvin Barge, who's going to help us talk about the Indiana Pacers. They've gotten off to the best start in the NBA with the 17-2 and record. Their defense just looks like you can't score on it at any time. They're dominating opponents. And it's all really starting with Paul George, so that's where I want to start this off as well. Uh, I want to know where we think he is right now in terms of player rankings and how high he could move up in the future. So, Marvin, let's hand it off to you. Paul George is definitely a top 10 player in the NBA right now. Um, the way he's going out there and scoring at will, it really seems like, um, is incredible. Um, the other day he was playing the Trailblazers and he had, he had that barrage of threes. It seemed like there was no stopping him. The only time they stopped him was when they knew it was coming. They blocked it. He still got the ball back shot and switched it. Like, Did it almost remind you of like prime T Mac? Because that's yes. what I was thinking during this. Yes, it's exactly what I think. Um, T Mac was my favorite player growing up. And so, like, looking at it, it's eerie. Um, obviously, T Mac, um, I think, is a little better offensively at this point in his career. But um, what Paul George brings that makes him more special than T Mac is um, his ability to play defense at such a high level. It's incredible. Dan, I know you think George is a little overrated. Uh, that was one of your Burns My Bacons earlier in our podcasting career. That but, is uh, absolutely that false. Uh, that was one of our guests, Burns My Bacon, I think when we had Phil on. I thought Paul George was overrated heading into the season. I think now he's definitely proved that he can sustain this high level of play. You and me had a, you and I had a conversation where I was bitching about Paul George's efficiency, and he's totally just made me look like a fool. He's shooting uh, close to 40% from beyond the arc as usual, but he's just shooting close to 47% overall. And like Marvin said, the fact that he can play defense is huge. There are plenty of point forwards in the NBA that just don't defend, and he's he has the potential to be one of the few perimeter defenders that could win Defensive Player of the Year. So I would agree that he's top 10, top 12 star right now. I think I want to go even further than that and say top five right now just because I don't know of any players that can make this big of a two-way impact. Could we go one podcast without you talking in Mark Jackson hyperbole? I didn't catch that. Can we go one podcast without you talking in Mark Jackson hyperbole? No, probably not. But is it hyperbole when it's true? Um, I don't think it's true. Name five players who you would rather have for one game right now. LeBron, Durant, um, CP3. Um, love, and I wouldn't rather have Love. He doesn't play defense. Uh, he rebounds. It's such an efficient. It's like playing like half the battle on defense is rebounding. I mean, there. Are, no, that's only four. I mean, I four could probably. You could just add to that list pretty easily. He had CP3, Durant, uh, LeBron. You have Stephen Curry. And like in this point guard league, I feel like I'd rather have. There are probably tons of point guards that I could just go through mm-hmm. that I'd rather have on my doesn't, team than Paul George right now. Doesn't George almost take away the need for a point guard, though, with the amount he handles the ball? Uh, I wouldn't say that. He's only averaging like three and a half assists. So it's not like he's making like He's going out there like running the Pacers' offense. Really, it's more Lance Stevenson is really doing that role of provider and creator for everyone else. Marvin really makes a great point about uh, the Pacers' offense. They're more of a success-by-committee team where Stevenson, Hill, and George shoulder the playmaking responsibilities, and I, I think it's Hill and Stevenson that do more of the work. Paul George is actually passing less than last season. His numbers are comparable to Carmelo Anthony's in terms of assist opportunities per game. Which, again, isn't a bad thing because he's scoring at such a high level. But I don't think he uh, removes the need for a point guard at all. I think you saw the Pacers struggle offensively last year, even when he was passing more, because they don't have that true creator. And I think they found a great way to cover up for it this season, and they continue to get better with it. But I don't think, I'm still, if I'm going to build a team, I'm going to build a team around a point guard 10 times out of 10 in this league. Unless it's LeBron. That's fair. He's a point guard. Yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a point guard trapped in a forward's body with an 80-year-old tear line. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I'm going to stick with my, my top five assertion. I understand why you guys don't think so, and I, I, I would hope that it's at least close in your mind, just because Dan's affinity for point guards. Uh, but what he's doing is still remarkable, and I feel like his success is sustainable even if the Pacers – necessarily isn't. They're on pace to go 73-9 and nine right now, which, as we know, would be the best record of all time. Obviously, that's not going to happen, but 
they could seriously make a run at that number one seed in the Eastern Conference. And I know they desperately want home court advantage after getting beat in Game 7 by the Heat last last season. Do you honestly think they're going to finish with a better record than the Heat? No, I don't. I I don't. I think it's a possibility, but, I mean, they're clearly the two best teams in the East. There's no one else we can even put in the same tier as them or even a tier below them at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Wizards are in third at 9-9 and right now. But uh, it's going to be a close race if if for no reason other than the Heat don't need it. It's it's more beneficial for them to rest LeBron, to rest Chris Bosh, to let Dwayne Wade's knees actually function like knees on a regular basis than it is for them to get home court advantage because they probably are still the most talented team in the league when all of their pieces are healthy. Well, the thing is... Um... The Heat are going to get injured. Like, you have Dwayne Wade, who always misses, like, loads of time every season. Chris Bosh has, sh- has shown that he gets injured. Um, he'll miss a few games this season. Um, LeBron's the only consistent factor there, I guess, as far as the big boys go. And the thing is, like, the Pacers, they don't have injury from pieces. Like, I think the most injury from, they don't have them. They're all durable. They're, um, they last the rest of the season. And, the, like, the only piece that they're missing is Ranger. And I'm not convinced he's going to finish this season as a Pacer, you know? So, um, I really think the Pacers are in it. Are going to sprint this regular season. I mean, the Heat always jog, you know? You guys actually make really good points uh, about the Heat in terms of them needing to rest and not caring about the regular season as much, I guess. And even though I'm kind of against the Pacers having that better record in terms of I don't think it'll happen... You, you do have to give the Pacers credit for not being an offensive liability anymore. They're in the top half of the league in offensive efficiency, and I think that bodes well for them if they're trying to finish with a better regular season record than the Heat. And then you go into the postseason, and this is a team that's built for the postseason. Short, rotation, short rotations, staunch defense. So I think they do have a real shot to maybe even come out of the East. I'm just... I just uh, I don't I don't see them as a team that's ready to win a championship right now. I don't see them as being on that level. If you give me seven games, them and the Heat, I don't see them having the mental capacity and the just the experience right now to get over that hump. And that's probably my biggest fear with this club because they are so shallow and still so young. And uh, again, I'm probably falling in the minority at this point, but I could see them having the better record than the Heat. I could see them coming out of the East but I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I I agree with everything you just said, other than them not having experience. I mean, this is a team that went to the Eastern Conference Finals last year. They pushed Miami to the brink. I mean, they were one one play away from winning, potentially. And now now they have a whole other season together with the same starting lineup, the same main pieces, and a little more depth. So I disagree with you on the experience front. But I would agree that while they have the upside to get past Miami, both in the regular season and the playoffs, that they probably won't do that. I think that beyond Paul George, if you can if you can shut him down, you take the offense to flow completely away from Indiana. And LeBron is capable of doing that. And that that's still my biggest concern. I don't know where the points are generated against another defense once Miami starts clicking. Can we also oh go ahead, Marvin? I want to hear this. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, um, you look at the last few years, um, the team that consistently pushed those the Celtics to that, I mean, not the Celtics, the, the team that continues to push the Heat to that hot, to that next level has been the Pacers. You know, you saw it um, two years ago when um, it was, they didn't have Bosch, and um, LeBron and Wade went into Super Saiyan mode and just absolutely crushed them. And then you saw it last year. And you know, forced the game seven. It was all. It was a close game seven. It was all the way to the end. So really, I think um, with Paul George taking another step, I think the the role of Matt Stevenson is going to be a huge wild card. If he can continue to play like he's playing, or like he what he's cooled down a little bit, but if he can continue to increase his level of play, he's averaging twelve point six and a half rebounds and five assists. He's play, he's doing it everywhere on the floor. Um, you would like to see him play better defense. But what he's doing outside of man-to-man defense is creating something that they don't have. Is that creator that main go-to guy who's going to feed everybody else and make everyone else better. The, my biggest thing with the Pacers, and you kind of touched upon it just now, is 
there always seems to be a caveat with them. Like, they push the heat to the brink when the heat didn't have Chris Bosh. They push the heat to seven games when Dwayne Wade sucks. So it's just, again, I'm not trying to take anything away from them, but we're even talking about Lance Stevenson's great, but he has to do this, and you don't know. He has to put up an Andre Iguodala-type stat line, and you don't know if he's going to do that. So that's probably why I doubt them the most. And the, the second reason is definitely they haven't done anything or rather beaten a team this season that's just convinced me really that they're for real, or they haven't done it consistently. They've had the second easiest schedule in the NBA. And again, I'm not trying to take anything away from a team that's 17-2, and two, but they just seem to have so many questions for a quote-unquote title contender to where I think that they've become overrated because we're expecting them to do all these things if this happens, if that happens. And so, and it's like Adam said before, they're, they're so reliant on one player on the offensive end that what happens when you shut down their offense? Like, there are good wing stoppers out there like LeBron, and who I don't know who else they're going to meet in the playoffs if they do face the Bulls. That could wind up being a grudge match with Dang and Jimmy Butler if they're healthy. So there's just so many things that's just if this, if that. I don't know if – I just feel like that's going to hinder them moving forward. So I think we pretty definitely know that Dan does not expect them to come out of the East, but I'm, I'm still a little confused on where you stand, Marvin. It seems like you're leaning towards them having the potential to beat the Heat, but no more waffling. Do you think they will or not? They won't, unfortunately. Um, I really wish they would. Um, I think it's well noted, at least in my favor, of how much I hate the Heat. But um, I, I mean, I really think they're the they're the team with the best shot in the East, obviously. And um, I think their shot is at least a forty percent shot. I think I don't think it's nearly as far as the Heat will win that series definitively. I think it's going to go six or seven games. Every game is going to be close. And the Pacers could eke out, you know, a series win in the finals. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say no as well. Um, I love their defense. I, we haven't really touched on just how good it is. I mean, they, they have a 93.6 defensive rating right now. Them and, them and the Spurs are the only teams below 100, and the Spurs are three points behind. I mean, that's a ridiculous gap for the number one team to hold. But the problem is the Heat make you change your defensive system. You have to adapt when you're playing a LeBron James and a team that, that, that has that much talent. And that still doesn't bode well for their, their ability to squeeze out what, what should still be a closely contested series. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with a no as well. But that said, I do think there's one thing that could push them over the top, and that's Danny Granger, whether he is either healthy or he gets traded. So do we have any trade ideas? I mean, things that you think could happen that they could bring in a new piece that could push them over the top? Yeah, if they want Andrea Bargnani, they could have him. <laughs> He's I really, a shot-blocking machine, but I, I probably not. <laughs> I think, I really think that any player at this point would be an improvement because Bencher hasn't played. So, like, and you don't know, like, what you're getting for him. So if you get any decent, old, like, wing player that can shoot threes and play a little bit of defense... You know, we always talk about these 3 and D guys. And they're not a ton of them. There's a few of them. And uh, there might be a few. You might be able to see, like, Carlos Stofino becoming available later in the season. You might be able to see um, some other guys that can just shoot the lights out and give you some other things across the board. And, you know, any player, I repeat, would be good for them besides Ranger Singh and the bench in the seat. I think I'd still like to see them trade for Eric Gordon. You got the hometown connection because he played at Indiana. He'd obviously be a fan favorite, and it helps it helps free up some stuff for the Pelicans because they could shift Evans over to shooting guard, and they could start Granger if he's ever healthy. Uh, and that pushes Stevenson to a bench role, which isn't as much of a demotion as an admission that he can create for that second team and really be that go-to player. I'd rather see them trade for a legitimate point guard, maybe move George Hill to the bench or something, uh, my ideal trade, which I came up with a while ago, it would be if they could somehow make a move for Ray John Rondo, built around Granger's expiring contract and maybe some draft picks. But more realistic target could be maybe Kyle Lowry, because the Raptors, I'm convinced they're going to mail it in at some point this year. He's on an expiring deal. If they're willing to give the Raptors a draft pick, then maybe the Raptors will take on some extra salary this year, because it's going to come off the books anyway. Or another intriguing option, I guess, and this is, 
it's not so much as a good one as I just wonder what would happen. The Pacers seem like the perfect team for a player like Courtney Lee to thrive on. No, nobody? I can see it. Uh, one that just came to mind for me, and it's important to remember that we're all coming up with contemporaneously, is over to the Houston Rockets for maybe like a combination of Patrick Beverly and the Sheik. You get a little bit more depth. You get a, a, a solid defender at the point who can also shoot the ball. Um, and Houston gets a player who can potentially play, potentially play a little bit of the four in small ball lineups. I think my ideal candidate for them would be Goran Dragic. I think that would be a perfect trade target for them, even more than Kyle Lowry. Or I mean, Ray John Rondo obviously would be great, but I see that seems unrealistic. But the Suns are playing so well, and they're in the West where they're not going to do anything anyway. So if they're going to trade him, that would be again. I want them to get a point guard. I don't think I think their front court. I don't want to say they could use the extra depth, but I think point guard is more pressing. Again, how long can their offense? cover up for the absence of a primary playmaker, so to speak? Um, I think the offense is going to continue. To, um, I think they're going to see a little bit of fall. Obviously, the Pacers aren't offensive juggernauts. Um, they proved last year for at least the first half of the year that they were everything. But, and, um, and I know you've seen like the development of Stevenson and uh, Paul George. But it's just going to continue to be like a mid-ring to slightly above average offense, and I, don't, I think that's where it's, I think that's where it's maxed out. Until like Dan said, we get they get another playmaking um, point guard, someone that's going to create more offense for more people. I would also like to see how their we all know that their defense is going to be amazing, but can it hold up at its current pace? Would be another question. When their their schedule is going to get tougher as they start playing better teams, and right now if they finished. Uh, their defensive rating is 93.6, I think you said, Adam, or something like that. I remember checking the other day. That would be tied for the second lowest defensive rating in NBA history if they kept that up. So that's, again, I'm not saying they can't, but as their schedule starts to get more difficult and they rely so heavily on their defense as it is, can they play at this level all season where they're winning so many games because their defense is playing so well? They haven't really gone up against, again, the best teams with incredible offenses so that would be another question for me. I mean, obviously we know they're going to be good, but can they be historically good? Yeah, I think so. I, there was an article run a couple days ago, I think it might have been on Sports Illustrated, about whether their defense is the best of all time. Uh, I think that that is a little too hyperbolic for my taste this early in the season. That is but saying I, something. <laughs> I think it's worth uh, at least putting them in that debate or acknowledging that they have the potential to be in that debate just because how good it looks now and Granger could eventually come back and provide a little more defensive depth. I mean, he's an adequate defender. He can be a plus defender on some nights. So I, I don't think it'll emerge as the greatest of all time. I, I have, I have some concerns about Hibbert's ability to be this good throughout an entire season, especially since he's struggling on offense and that could affect his confidence. Um, but it, there's no doubt that it's the best in the league. I would probably also throw David West into that same equation. I'm not as worried about Hibbert anymore as I am West. He's he started to pick up his play now. He's playing really well, but he started the season so bad that made me just think that this is going to be one of those turbulent campaigns for him, and I think he's, we talked about this earlier, he's probably the second most important player on that team in terms of what he brings in intangibles, so I want to see him... St- he not only needs to stay healthy, he needs to play at a high level. So that would be, again, just another question of mine. I have so many questions about this team, and I guess that's why I doubt them so much, at least more than you two, obviously. Marvin, it's a good thing you're here because Dan and I have a never-ending debate about David West. I think he's really good. David, uh, Dan thinks he's incredibly overrated, so we need you to settle that for us. Well, wait, wait, let me, I would like to, before you speak, I'm not saying he's incredibly... He's a replacement level player, just belongs on the bench. That's that's absolutely false. I don't think he was worth three years, $36 million at his age, history of knee injuries. And you know what the stats he's putting up right now? I don't want to pay $12 million a year for. Yeah, he's putting up those stats on a 17-2 and team, though. But anyway, let's let Marvin take this one. Um, I think David West, I'm going to put you out here and say he's appropriately rated at this point. Um, I think there was a time when he originally got that contract where he might be a little overrated. And then there was the time back um, when he was with the Hornets, when he was playing with C3, where he was super overrated. 
So I think there's um there's gonna return to reasonable expectations of his play. You know what you're getting with him. He's gonna box out every every time down the court. He's gonna try he's gonna try his damnedest to get as many rebounds as possible. He's gonna shoot that fifteen footer like it's money. And um I think he's a I think he's an above average player. I think he's a very I think he's an above average starter. And I think that's very screw it stops. He's <laughs> He's not really getting awards. He's not gonna, you know, blow you away every night. But you have to account for more offense, and he's going to be there playing hard defense. So. Unfortunately, I have to agree with Marvin. And I actually came into this podcast accepting the fact that I had to acknowledge that I was a little wrong on West. Uh, we, <laughs> I couldn't hear you. Could you say that again? I was wrong about David West. <laughs> Dan was right. That doesn't mean you should listen to him about everything, but yeah, yeah. He, he got me on this one. Uh, there remains to be seen on the ridiculous other number of bets that we've made throughout this these podcasts. Um, but with that out of the way, I think it's time to move on and find out what is burning Marvin's bacon. Bacon! Bacon! Where's the bacon? I smell bacon! 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 Gotta be bacon! Only one thing smells like bacon! bacon. Alright, I'll tell you what's burning my bacon, Adam. I am absolutely pissed about the lack of coverage the Hawks are getting. The East is so awful, and the Hawks have actually proven to be somewhat competent in playing. Everyone forgets this is a team that just got a new head coach with a new system. They're trying to play like the Spurs, um, which is not something you achieve overnight. Um, I really think Daniel Hoser was a great pickup. I really like the direction that this team is going. I like that they're getting out Horford the ball more. I like Paul Millsap's involvement. Him shooting the three over the last few weeks has been sublime, really. It's been a beautiful thing to watch. And uh, Kyle Corver, obviously, you know what you're getting with him. And you know, but you have a few X factors in like the Mary Carroll and um, I hate Cartier Martin. But I think he ha- he can ha- he has some room to improve. There's um there's a lot of X factor here, and the Hawks could definitely be right there at that third seed come the end of the season. And I don't know. They could, you know, make some playoff magic. That's all I hope for as a Hawks fan. I can't hope for them to contend. But I really would like to see um, some more all-star uh, considerations for Al Horford. And, you know, maybe, like, a 12th man on the all-star team for, like, Paul Millsap has turned up some great numbers here in December. All right, so that's what's burning Marvin's bacon today. We want to find out what makes you sizzle. We want to know... What do you think of the Pacers, how they're going to fare in the Eastern Conference during both the regular season and the playoffs? Again, we want to thank Marvin for coming on the show today. Uh, For Dan Trevally, this is Adam Cromwell with the Full Court Press.